And I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight, um, Brendan Murphy. For those of you that got a flyer last month, he's um, going to talk about Croton Woodlands Under Siege. Uh, he's worked, Brendan has worked with forest landowners from uh, private and public sectors on developing forest management plans, um, providing technical stewardship assistance and implementing, sounds like a lot of words here, uh, stream side plantings for water quality protection, which is called Trees for Trips. I think we've had that around the Silver Lake area, if I'm correct. Am I right? We did that there. Okay. Um, Brendan ha is currently serving on the town of Cortland CAC. He holds a BS in Forest Resources Management from SUNY ESF and an AAS in Forest Technology from SUNY ESF Ranger School. And I'm sure there's a lot of other things that you could talk about, but um, let's uh, have a round of applause for Brendan Murphy. Thanks, thanks for that lovely uh, intro, Alan, and, and thanks to everyone here for, for coming out on uh, an evening, taking time away from your, your family and friends and all, you, all the other things you're doing in spring to getting your properties ready. To, so thanks, thanks for, for coming here. Um, healthy forests and clean water, that's what I'm here to talk about today. <laughs> One, keep our woods as woods. It's very difficult to reestablish a forest once you lose it. It's very expensive. You're talking thousands of dollars per acre just for the first year. So apparently I need to go a little bit further over. There we go. It all starts in your backyard, and there's really, really something for everything. Start small, little bits add up to something big. And there are lots of ways to get involved, not just in your backyard, but out of all the, the wonderful parks and preserves in our area, volunteer. Oh. Maybe I'll stand on the other side. So our, our roadmap for tonight, some background information, talk a little bit about the forest growth cycle and the threats, you know, the under siege part. And the bottom line for Westchester's woods and some ideas were maybe not just ideas, but a discussion amongst all of us about what could be done. So I work for the Watershed Agricultural Council. We're, we're a nonprofit that's privately run and publicly funded. We're kind of an odd beast. Um, we're run by uh, committees made up of really just local landowners, foresters, loggers, educators, and that's who runs our organization. We're funded by New York City the United States Forest Service and the United States Department of Agriculture. We work in the New York City watershed water supply region and of course the watershed counties as well. It's a big watershed, uh, 2,000 square miles, 90% of the water coming from up here in the Catskills and maybe 10 to 30% depending on what the situation is down here in the Croton watershed. What makes this so unique is that in New York City it, they're not directly in control of the way the land is managed that provides their water. Uh, other cities are like this, well, other cities are similar to like Boston. They get their water from central Massachusetts, but they own all that property. New York City doesn't. Most of this property is owned by private citizens and other municipalities. But the stuff I'm here to talk about tonight is not just relevant to New York City. It's really, you know, because forests don't stop at political boundaries. They don't stop at watershed lines. It's all connected. It's one system. So it's really relevant to the whole lower Hudson Valley and here in northern Westchester. One of the big ideas which we like to promote something called the working forested landscape. It's an idea, it's an idea that recognizes that our forests are not static. They're, they're very dynamic and whether we interject to change the direction in which they're going, they're going to force do what they want to do no matter what. So we could jump in to make sure that they provide us with a continuous ecosystem services or we can let them go and they'll still provide us those services perhaps or perhaps not at the level which we expect them to or, or demand them to. Sustainable forestry is another, is another way of putting that. So why do trees, how do they protect water quality? This is a lovely diagram we had some of our colleagues work up and it's what we'll call it a stream on the left side is one property has managed a particular way and on the right side another property that's managed another particular way and you could probably list 50 things that are going on here I gave a, a presentation yesterday to a group of um, 
high school students over at John Jay High School, uh, AP Environmental Science students, and I said, all right, I want to see five things that happen. And one kid, first thing, raised his hand and said, well, the person on the left is being attacked by bees. <laughs> and I said, well, that's, those are actually grass clippings, and they're going right into the stream, which is probably not good for the water quality. Um, but there's, there's more than that. I mean, th these is really a, a stream-side forest, a buffer against this, against this water body, also known as a riparian area. And you want to make sure that there's as much vegetation there as possible. Trees have a very positive effect on the quality of the water, even dead trees. Like this log right here that falls into the stream, it can slow down the velocity of water. Quick moving water can erode the stream banks uh, and pollute the aquatic habitats. Also wonderful for recreation and wildlife. You have den trees, you have birds flying over, you have various layers of, of habitat, which is great for, for some birds. Birds don't just need big mature forests, they need shrub layers too and mid-story layers. So that's that's how trees protect water quality. That's, that's the relationship which our organization is particularly interested in and we work with, with landowners to help them manage them one way or another. That sounds like a silly question, right? How do our, how do our woods grow? I'll make it simple. It's a, it's a cycle of natural disturbance, growing conditions, and death and birth. If you think about forest that way, just driving down the road, just look to the right, look to the left, and see, see what you can pick up. Really, there's, you need to have good growing conditions, and that, that leads to birth, as well as the growth of a healthy forest. But eventually, there's a natural disturbance. Sometimes it's in the form of a single tree. Like this is a 150-year-old sugar maple, which died not from anything crazy, it was old age. It was 150 years old, and that created a gap in the canopy. Very large tree, very dominant, over 100 feet high, and that left a hole in the canopy, probably by half the size of this room. That's a natural disturbance. That affected the forest on all around it and below it as well. Probably what happened is this, this hemlock tree on the right is now going to become a little bit more dominant, and perhaps these other trees on the left might as well. Uh, maybe there's some trees on the ground that are going to grow up. But it's not always a single tree. Sometimes you get groups of trees that create these patches. Perhaps some of our woodlands experienced this when Hurricane Irene came down. You know, it wasn't a massive hurricane like the 1938 hurricane, which blew down huge amounts of, of, of trees, just especially over Massachusetts. I've heard reports that half the forests were blown down. But with Irene, it was more like this, maybe 5, 10, 20 trees. It's natural disturbance, and what's going to happen here? Well, this beech tree is probably going to take over and become the new, the new forest. The growing conditions are good, um, and that's the cycle. Sometimes it's even bigger. This was a 90-acre 90, 90 blowdown. Probably happened in five seconds. It was an F2 tornado. This is in central New York. And that's, that's actually me standing on the trees trying to assess the situation. And I grew up playing Where's Waldo. Do you see the second person in here? There's a second person. He should, well, his hard hat was green, so that wouldn't help out too much if he got hurt. But there he is right there, all six foot of him, looks like a tiny ant in this thing. And we're both probably 15 feet in the air. So, you know, disturbances come in various shapes and sizes. And it's a natural, natural process, and forests have lived for thousands of years with this happening. And they've always been able to regenerate. They've always been able to restart the cycle. Like I just said, growing conditions must be adequate following these events. Okay, there, we'll, we'll talk about five threats to these growing conditions, the under siege part, and five things you can do about it. Yeah, there's a lot more than five. These are just five ones I think are most relevant to, to here in northern Westchester, perhaps the greater lower Hudson Valley. We can, I can stand here and talk for hours about this, so we'll, we'll, keep, we'll try to keep it short. Subject number one, what's wrong? wrong with this? That's true. Everyone, everyone's, that's very true, but I'm looking at something else with this one. What was that? Yeah, too close together, actually. This is a little bit too dense. Forests, trees are like tomatoes, tomatoes in your garden. If you plant them too close together, you're not going to get very many tomatoes, or if you do, they're going to be small. Same thing for anyone who has fruit trees. You have to thin out your apples. You cut them back, because a fruit tree will produce just as much, uh, always produce the same volume, but if you cut back the number, then the individual apples will get bigger. It's the same thing with trees in a forest. When a forest becomes first established, it's 
tens of thousands, 50, maybe 50 to 100,000 trees per acre. And eventually, as it, as it grows, the smaller ones die off. And that's, that's a natural process. But there's something lost during that. The trees that are left, or well, in this case, this is from this is, uh, sugar maples, maybe about 40 or 50 years old over in the town of Pound Ridge. They're growing very close together in this negatively impact, as natural as it is, it could be better. Um, their crowns are smaller, they're not able to photosynthesize as much, they're not soaking up as much nutrients or water as they could. Also, their rates of growth are slower. All that together, they're, they're more susceptible to certain diseases, certain natural disturbance events. So one, one of the things that some people do, and this is from the Catskills, this is probably, a, these are actually red maples, not sugar maples, but the same age forest, and they went through and they actually cut down about 25% of the trees. This is called a thinning. Smaller diameter trees, and they did it kind of evenly spaced out. And the end result was that each tree that was left had more growing space. Also, more, more water and nutrients, which is available to those trees to uptake. Stands that are, have this done to them versus stands that are not, over, let's say, 50 to 100 years, the effects could be really dramatic. Uh, Trees that have been thinned like this could be six, eight, ten, a foot bigger in diameter over the lifespan of those trees. It's just, I've seen it, it makes such an enormous difference. Let's see here. I think I'll get this right by now. All right, num number two. This is actually taken from the, um, the Mount Nimmin Fire Tower. Has anyone ever been up there? That is so neat up in the town of Kent there in Putnam County. So, I'll just, I'll just tell you, this is all, it's all even age. This was all farmland that was probably abandoned all around the same time. And that's great, Mo that's where most of our forest came from today. Uh, this was all agricultural land, and it was all abandoned around the same time. Uh, and it regrew, and that's great, but now we have all of our eggs in one basket. Most of our trees are, you know, give, put a range around it. You can pretty much call most of it the same, and that, that could be a problem because certain natural disturbance events only affect certain age classes of trees. For example, one time, I, uh, that, that tornado that I showed you earlier, those trees that it hit were about 100 years old. But just to the left of that, there was an old farm field that was abandoned about 30 years ago. And the trees were much smaller and much younger. And even though it went right over that, those trees ended up being fine because they were young enough to withstand that. As soon as it hit those trees that were 100 years, well, you saw what happened. This is a, not not the same area, but the same concept. Pretty much all farm field that was abandoned at the same time. This is from central New York, actually, near the just northeast northwest of Binghamton. I have all these pictures from upstate New York because I used to work for the state uh, Department of Environmental Conservation. I was a forestry technician, and I helped them manage their their state forests. It was about 100,000 acres that were managed out of that forest, and we, we managed them for recreation, you know, biodiversity, and actually one of the big things when I was there was something called early successional habitat. Um, we we're trying, there was a great decrease in the amount of grouse that, that were up in that part of the state, and not just up there, really all throughout the Northeast. So we're looking at large tracts of even age forests and trying to figure out how could we diversify this while at the same time improving bird habitat for some species. So I say this is all even, not, not true. This is right here in the center, you see this patch. That wasn't from a storm, it, it, it is natural, well, it's disturbed, it's not natural though, that was actually man-made. And this was, this is a picture taken two years after it happened. This was maybe four or five acres that was cut down and actually went to a local, uh, I forget what type of mill it was, it might have been a paper mill. But this was the result. This was a young stand, now two years old, of aspen. So thick you can't even walk through it. And go figure, guess what's there now that wasn't there? The grouse. Yeah. And, and their strategy is to keep doing this over, over, over the whole stretch of forest. And the results over 50 years are going to be this those mosaic of in, in the diversity of ages, which is going to be, as it turns out, better for the birds. And so they're, they're spreading their eggs uh, into different baskets. Here's another photo. Um, this is a little less obvious. These forests are, a lot of our forests around here are middle-aged. Once our forests, because of the species that we have, get somewhere between, I'll generalize a little bit, between 50 and 100 years, 
they start to reach this, this critical point where some can live longer, like this white oak that's actually, it's like this big, it's like a three foot diameter white oak, but, um, but some of the trees on the right are, are actually ash and they're not gonna live as long. So whether we want it or not, you know, uh, whether it related or not, these trees are getting older and they are gonna start to die off. And what's gonna take their place? So the same picture I just showed you before applies to this as well. Well, we know what's going on here. Did you uh, encounter something like this on the aqueduct? Not that bad. <laughs> yeah, too many invasive species. That's, that's a problem. Uh, I guess I don't need to go too much more detail into that. But I did want to talk about how they relate to natural disturbance. This is a picture taken at uh, the Valeria easement. I think, I think it's in the town of Cortland, but the Westchester Land Trust has the easement there. I was walking with, uh, with David Emerson, um, the director of stewardship, and we came across this, this line, whoops. Well, not a line in the sand, but a line in the forest, certainly. And that's Japanese stilt grass. Was that talked about last month at the? Um, well, Japanese stilt grass is here, and it, it seems to respond very positively, positively for itself, negatively for us, to a natural disturbance. So in the distance, the canopy was disturbed. This was actually all ash, white ash, and they were dying off probably from the ash yellow. And here where I was standing, the canopy was much denser. It was uh, things like red maple, and there were some oaks. Go figure, look at all the shade, there's no, there's no stilt grass. It's also much more moist over there, and it's been, I've seen some studies that say, yeah, it does better well, it does better when it's more moist, when it's drier, but it was just one of those moments like, oh, I get it, this stuff can respond to natural disturbance. What else responds to natural disturbance? Japanese, Japanese stilt grass. Stilt, stilt, yeah. Stilt grass. It was originally brought over as packing material before we had styrofoam. And if you've ever played around with it in the, in the fall, once it's, you know, it gets this tall and it falls over, yeah, it's just, just it's great packing material. I don't blame them for bringing it over. <laughs> so that's the relationship between uh, invasives and natural disturbance. When something happens, we know what's gonna take over. Keep an eye out for new arrivals. It's a lot easier that way. If, you know, if we found the one multi-floor rose when it was just one, that would have been a lot easier than, than taking care of thousands of acres of it now. So maybe there are some other uh, new ones that are in the area that aren't as well established as some of these traditional ones. Some off the top of my head are maybe black swallowwort. That's, that's here, but it's not at the same level as some of these other invasives, which we're much more used to. I would maybe put bamboo into that category as well. Um, is, and some of you probably have other, you know, even other ones that I'm not aware of that other people might not as well. So. Are there, any, are there any that just come to the top of your head? Some new ones that are out there that haven't taken over everything yet? Japanese knotweed. Japanese knotweed. Yeah, that's a re relatively newer one. Um, a tough one to get rid of, let me say. Um, whoops. Hello. Don't look. <laughs> So in conclusion, no, just kidding. Let's see here. Not, okay, not enough regeneration. Yeah, this is the, the classic photo everyone's seen. The browse line, everything gets eaten below. And when they're starving, they even eat the thorns. It's really impressive. The, the classic deer fence photo, oak trees on the right, nothing on the left. It's a great quote. If we wish to sustainably maintain forest cover, diversity, and function, we should take action now to improve our understanding of this important issue and incorporate new information to resource management decisions. Who said this? The Nature Conservancy. This is a report they issued, I guess, two years ago now. Here's a map from that report called Forest Regeneration in New York State. This is for dominant um, canopy species. They call it timber species, things like heart, uh, sugar maple and, and oak and things like that, but it's a map showing if the overstory were to be disturbed, either natural disturbance or what have you, is there enough trees on the ground to have the next generation of forests? Red means no, orange means 
yeah, you get good luck. Uh, there's not much green up there. Some, in the, some up there in the Adirondacks, some over here, but really the nearest patch of green to us is probably all the way up here in the northern Catskills. So that's very telling. So we ask the question, what are our forests going to look like in 50 years? Well, it's not just us, it's half the state. Half the state is in trouble, probably from some of the same issues we're experiencing. In the Catskills, they're experimenting with, well, we'll definitely say large-scale large works. This is uh, a Frost Valley YMCA. Um, this is a 30-acre piece. And before I showed you that picture, we did the thinning, where maybe 20, 25% of the trees were removed. Well, they weren't removed. They were cut and left in place. Some, maybe the landowner couldn't have hauled those out for firewood, perhaps, but they chose not to. This is actually a 30-acre, uh, what we call shelter wood, much heavier. About half the trees were cut down. And so there's an aerial shot of that. And they also fenced it in. They fenced it in. Yes, they fenced it in. That's a biggie, yes. And this is on the ground uh, from a couple years ago. And it's pretty clear that, yeah, there is a fence there. The far side of the fence, and on this side, well, there's nothing really, just some of the, some of the trees that on the ground. A closer look. After doing the counts, they were finding about 30,000 stems per acre which is about one every, we'll just say one for every square foot on the ground. It's certainly enough to have a new forest. If they hadn't had that fence, it, it would have failed. Um, so that's what some people can do on a larger scale to facilitate that changeover to the next generation. It doesn't always have to be that big. This is a small scale project. I want to say 100 feet by 100 feet. It's a quarter acre. Even things that small could really make a difference at the local level. It's something that people can, can handle a little bit better. This was, you can purchase this, this fence material from a, a store called, I'll tell you their web address, nodeer.com. It's that simple. No-deer.com. It's a seven and a half foot high uh, deer fence. They're out of Orange, Connecticut. It's a mom and pop joint. I've ordered some materials from them before. Really great to work with. So it's, it's, I forget what it ended up costing. Maybe $1.50 to two, two feet per linear, no, $1.50 to $2 per linear foot. That's what it costs. Uh, talk to me afterwards, I can tell you more details about that. Okay, so this, this very simple chart, which the world follows, I showed you before, obviously not quite like that. Really, our growing conditions are quite a bit less a lot less birth. Natural disturbance seems to be increasing a little bit more, uh, leading to more deaths. So the cycle's out of balance. So we know what that means. Our forests provide us with a particular set of ecosystem services. They give us clean water. They give us clean air, biodiversity, recreation, carbon sequestration. How about that one? About half of the town of Cortland is forested. Think about all the carbon that's stored in that. And every year that this cycle's out of balance, there's less and less carbon that's stored there. If you add it, you can, it depends on what forest you're in, but you have about 100 tons of carbon per acre on a forest. So do the math. It's a significant amount. And when you do, it ends up being equivalent on the same scale as transportation emissions for a town. So it's, it's not just water. There's a whole system of things that are, that are being affected. This is neat. Um, the Westchester County GIS website, really cool. They have time, well, essentially time-lapse photography for the whole county, going back to 1947 and 1960, 76, 2004, 2007, and 2009. So it lets, it lets you to see what happened. If you're standing in a forest and you wonder, oh, this looks like it's been here for a thousand years, well, you can check here. You can see. So this is Brinton Brook. I'm not sure of the streets, maybe some of you are familiar with more of the local landmarks, but I do know this is approximately uh, Brinton Brook. So we'll see what happens here. A lot of it, what, maybe half of it was at old agricultural fields, some of it a bit older. 1960, 76, up to 2009, virtually all forested again. Looks like a little patchy up here at the top still, for whatever reason. It's a meadow? Okay, well that's why. So it was purposely left like that, perhaps. Um, so proof that our forests, uh, you know, in the 40s and 60s were able, that cycle wasn't balanced. This is proof. 
so if that was field in the 80s and we're able to do this, would it still become a forest as it is today? Maybe. It probably depends on where you were in the county. Some areas, probably not. Some, prob some areas, yes. But it's a good question to ask as you're looking around at you know, hiking through your local park or preserve, what would happen right here? Look on the ground. You can, you can see the evidence. You can see any trees that are there. You can look at the health of the current trees. And you can form your own hypothesis on what's going to happen. And maybe ask, well, what could we possibly do about this? So again, those same ones, it's about, what's the percentage? Around 60% of northern Westchester is forested. That's quite a bit for being really only 40, 50 miles north of New York, north of New York City. That's, that's an impressive statistic, I think. Um, and once it's gone, it's difficult and expensive to place. But hopefully I've given a couple ideas, of things that could be done to increase the health of these forests to make sure that they can live another 5, 10, 50, or 100 years, because they certainly have the capacity to. They just get a little bit of a help. It, it does start in your, your backyard. Um, you know, even here in the village of Croton, think about the plants you have. How, how, if you're walking through the woods, you're a mile away from the road, and a barberry is here. Like, how did this get here? It wasn't planted there. It came from, from somewhere else. So even if people down in the Bronx, I tell people, I have family in the Bronx, and they have this big tree of heaven. I said, you guys really got to cut that down. You think the seed just stays in your property? That's going to fly off, and eventually that's going to spread somewhere. So every, the ecosystem is connected. It has nothing to do with where you are in the county or how densely populated it is. It's, everything's connected. Start in your backyard. Start small. It doesn't have to be a big scale project like that one I showed you, that big 30-acre deer fence. That's crazy. It cost a ton of money. No one here is going to do that. Start small. Something manageable. There are lots of ways to get involved. Volunteer at your local parks and preserves. I know there's someone here from Sawmill River Audubon. Brinton Brook, you know, Northern Westchester had a six-figure number, uh, a six-figure population for that 60% forested. That's a huge amount of uh, people per acre. If we value our parks, we value our ecosystems, there's ways to get involved. Support your CAC coming to events like this. That's really great. Um, Ellen was talking about the Earth Day events, and we were hearing about the vine cutting, and Bob Del Toro is notorious for cutting vines all over the place. So there's, there's people who can help coordinate these, these volunteer activities. And stay ahead of the curve. Come to events like this. Talk to your CAC. Talk to some of the other resource professionals around. Um, if you're hearing about, say, an invasive plant or an invasive insect five to 10 years after it's here, that's might be a little bit too late. So try to stay ahead of the curve of, of what's happening. Our forests are constantly changing. The latest and greatest science is always changing, and there's, there's, ways to, there's ways to stay on top of that. Like I said, our funders, uh, New York City, the Forest Service, and the USDA. It's my contact information. I'm, I'm going to leave, leave it up with this, with this nice slide. And I guess I wanted to open it up to questions and, and discussion. They can grow in full shade or full sun. They tend to have a super dense canopy, so there's not much that can live underneath them besides, and go figure, other Norway maples. How to address those. It's important to keep them out of seed production. You have a big monster tree with a huge crown. It's, boy, this is tough. It's tough. It depends on where you are. Every tree, no matter native or non-native, has a particular benefit. So if you're in a downtown area and it's one of the last trees, maybe don't, maybe don't take it down. But if you're a little more on the outside of town, you can, yeah, I, I can live without this tree. Maybe take it down. Because every year that's up, that's producing thousands of seeds and it's spreading. It's, you know, all these invasives are never going to be 100% eradicated. They're always going to be here. So we got to figure out how to, how to live with them. And when a forest does, you know, when it comes time for a forest, you know, every forest has its end. When it does have its end, uh, be prepared to cut more of them so the natives can come up. Uh, does that answer your question? <laughs> cut them when you can. Right? Cut them when you can, yeah. It's, they were planted prolifically, not just here, but in other cities as well. The city of Syracuse, uh, 30, between 30 and 40 percent of the urban canopy is Norway maple. That's, so they can't just cut them down like that tomorrow. Um, 
Ice storms tend to do quite a number on them, as they did around here, as people noticed. That was one of the best things that came out of the ice storm. Nori maples hold on to their leaves a lot longer than, than the other native species. So where I live in Cortland, you know, it took me two days just to get out of my driveway because it, they, they stopped mowing along the driveway maybe 20, 30 years ago. I have a full canopy of Norway maples. They took quite a beating after the ice storm, though. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, literally, just the forest of far bearing and these middle aged trees. And I think to myself, well, when those trees go, do we just we lose the forest? Is that what's going to happen? It's not going to be the same. I mean, it's, it's possible they can come back through that. I mean, trees can. Re right. Um. <laughs> not, you know, it's going to be, it's not going to be black and white like that. There's definitely going to be some areas that'll be fine. It's going to happen over a long, it's not like tomorrow it's going to be like this. Next 50 to 100 years, this is going to start to happen. That's why I was trying to talk about some of the things that you can do. You know, just because it's barberry, that's great if you want to get rid of it. But if you're cutting barberry underneath really trees that are really healthy and probably going to be here for another 50 years, don't cut the barberry. Save it for the areas that are you know, just about to, like, oh, I'm going down. <laughs> Save it for those areas. Or plan ahead. Look at your property. Say someone has 100 acres. Plan ahead and think, okay, we can do maybe an acre of patches per year. Maybe one acre here. Wait two or three years. Do another acre. And slowly start to turn it into your favor. And that, that's when cutting that barberry out really makes a difference. They're always going to be here. It's a matter, a matter of figuring out how we can you know, manage our forest to to live with it. I, I started a second fence area and I took the barberry out and put it outside. I actually You relocated the, the barberry? <laughs> because there was one year the deer actually ate that, ate the barberry. They, they did this past fall actually. So you're thinking maybe they'll eat that instead of your seedlings. That, that's, please keep trying. If you, think, if you think it's working, by all means, go for it. Do people call you when they want some help with the, the forests and woodlands on their property? Yeah, like yeah, absolutely. If you're in the Croton watershed, I'll definitely come out to your property, especially if you have larger acreages. We have, I didn't even get into that. We do have funding programs. So if you have 10 acres of forest and you're in the watershed, we can pay to have a forester come in and write a plan for your property. He, can, he does an inventory. He assesses the health of your forest and gives you recommendations for it. And then we have um, other program which can help implement that as well. The Sawmill River Audubon Society has taken advantage of that. We've paid to have a couple plans on their property and they've actually installed some deer fencing as well. T-Town Lake Reservation also has a plan. Uh, there's how many people have signed up? Across both watersheds, almost a thousand landowners now, about 150,000 acres. So it's People have used it, and if you're in the watershed and you got 10 acres, talk to me. Can municipalities take advantage of that as well? Yes, the town of Yorktown has, the town of Somers has, and the Bedford Central. The village of Croton for all That's not in the watershed, though. Yeah, unfortunately, the village of Croton's outside, but there are other people who can help out. There's the Depar Department of Environmental Conservation. They have foresters that can come out to take a look. <laughs> Yes, the DEC, Region 3, and New Pulse. Their foresters cover Westchester, all of Westchester, all of Putnam, all of Duchess, and a couple of counties on the other side, too. But Cortland, the town of Cortland is in the Cortland Some of the town of Cortland is, about 10 or 15% of the eastern half. Yes. Uh -huh. Excuse me. Can I just go back to the Yes. Uh, Yeah, I'll put grapevine into that category too. And, and how um, invasive and oppressive they are. 
There's not enough being done. And I had the same question. I, I gave a talk, almost a similar presentation last month in Bedford. And the same question came up. I didn't have that good of an answer. <laughs> uh, the parkways are, you know, their own. Well, I think the parkways are owned by the county in Westchester, I think, like the sawmill. The, you're shaking your head no. Some are county and some are state. Some are county and some are state. The county gave up all of them but the Bronx, the Bronx River. Okay. Which is actually a county park. So those are the agencies who you have to contact to. There are a lot of success stories out there. Just last week, I, I got a, um, an e-news e thing from the Forest Service. Yeah, e-news thing. That was really, really specific, wasn't it? It was from, from uh, Washington, and they, there was this rip river that was listed as impaired maybe 20 years ago. And since then, the Forest Service has been implementing a whole wide range of things, including controlling uh, erosion on all the old logging roads. They were doing tree plantings you know, where the forest had failed along the stream, similar to what happens here in the Hudson Valley with trees for tribs. Uh, they also did, they diversified the canopy. They did harvest in some area. They um, did a whole bunch of things. And just within the last month, they've actually removed it from the list of impaired water bodies. So it took, there was many, dozens of agencies involved, and it took a decade or two. But it can be done. That photo makes the dam look so small, doesn't it? Thank you.